happening. And um, just thank you very much to the organisers, to, to Wayne Peter for having invited me. That's me. That is indeed I, yes, thank you. Um, um, I have to admit, I'm feeling a tiny bit like, I has just said he felt to the exhibit, I feel a bit like the other here, because I am absolutely not an ethnologist, so I'm presenting something from the point of view of art history, the fine arts. Um, more particularly, though, I'm working on the whole notion of the display of works of art during the 19th century, and the whole question of time in the museum within this context. Now then, um, on June the 5th, 1851, a new room opened in the Paris Louvre, a room which was already very well known to everyone, since it was, in fact, one of the most symbolically loaded rooms in the museum, the Salon Carré, the room which had hosted the annual or sometimes two yearly exhibition of contemporary art, very important element there, since 1725. It was in the Salon Carré, this main room, that during the Salon, the best works of contemporary art, mainly of the French school, were to be displayed for three weeks. It was an event which, within the museum temporality, was highly disruptive because for a considerable period of each year, the works that were on long-term display in the Salon Carré and in the adjoining rooms were not to be seen. Basically, what the authorities did was to set up a, a scaffold in front of the works of art which remained on the walls, hung um, tissue, um, pieces of, uh, of material down from, these, um, from this scaffolding, and then after that, they hung the works on top. So basically, you had the, the historical paintings behind and then the contemporary paintings in front. And it was not just during the three weeks that the room was inaccessible, but also during the whole preparation period and then the closing down of the exhibition. Now, in 1848, the time of the revolution in February, the museum got a new director, and then there was a whole programme of restoration and reorganisation that went on. And one of the fruits of this, just one, was this new Salon Carré, which you see here in a representation 13 years later. Now, the idea of this Salon Carré was that it would show, on a permanent basis, the masterpieces of European painting. A selection was made from the collections in the Louvre of the very best works, the masterpieces. We're going to come back time and time again to that question. Two years later, the Prado in Madrid decided to open a similar room, the Salon de la Reine Isabella, and so both these museums in Paris and in Madrid could now lay claim to having, there's a photo of this same room in the Prado, they could now lay claim to having a room which took as its model, as its inspiration, one of the most famous emblematic rooms in Western art history, i.e. the Tribuna in the um, Florence Uffizi Museum. This Tribuna had always been the home of the most precious treasures in the Medici collections, and during the late 18th century became a room in which the painting and sculpture masterpieces were housed. Now, as soon as we start to talk about one room in a museum which is designated as the sanctuary, the room in which the best works in the collection are to be kept, we are faced with a number of questions. Mainly, of course, how do you select these works? Which works are going to be selected? Who's going to be doing the selection? In Florence, the selection was made by two curators. In Madrid, it would seem, although the information is not entirely clear, that it was largely the director of the museum, Madrazzo Federico, who was um, organising the works. And for the Paris masterpiece room, the Salon Carré, we know that it was the new director of the museum, Jean Rang, and his head curator, Viau. In Paris, a first list was drawn up. Various modifications were made over the following years until the room's contents, as we saw in the 1861 image, had been decided. The contents in 1851, and we could also talk about the contents for Spain in 1853, because, and this is a very important element in our whole question of the temporality within the museum, these masterpiece rooms, where we would imagine that works remained stable for years, were actually rooms in which there was constant experimentation going on with the collections which makes us ask the whole question about what exactly do we mean by a masterpiece within the museum temporality. And this is one of the... Um, in Florence, on the other hand, of the 40 paintings that were to be seen in the Tribune in 1818, the vast majority was still in place in 1890. Florence, stability. Paris, on the other hand, 
Of the 73 hanging in the room in 1851, only seven were still there 50 years later. So most of the others had gone, and in Madrid, the situation was very much the same. Now, I'm going to come back to this point a bit later. So that's the first question, though. The second question is, which works are going to be selected? And here, <laughs> the most difficult question of all, and in fact, somebody already asked me the question during breakfast this morning, um, and I've had the time to prepare an answer, but <laughs> I still haven't found the answer, despite the amount of time I've been working on this question. What do we mean by masterpiece? <laughs> what is a masterpiece? Okay, masterpiece, Meister Stück, Mr. Stück, Chef d'oeuvre, Capolavoro, Obra Maestra. We've got the word in each language. That we've got. The meanings have changed over time and also within linguistic confines, but there are three main meanings which are accepted. First of all, it's a test piece. What we now think of as a masterpiece within our museums um, isn't necessarily the masterpiece for the 16th and 17th centuries, which could be a lock, which could be a table, which could be... It's the piece of work which you submit to your guild in order to become a master within your profession. That's the first meaning. Second meaning is a work considered to be the best work, or the most representative work by an artist. So it is an artist's masterpiece. And then the third meaning, which is probably closest to what we have in the masterpiece rooms, but then we're going to see this the whole question of the artistic figure behind it, is simply a work which is considered very good or canonical, either absolutely or in some particular respect. This was already accepted by the time that these masterpiece rooms are being set up in the um, mid-19th century, in Johnson's Dictionary of 1828, we find for masterpiece anything done or made with extraordinary skill. In Elm's Dictionary of the Fine Arts in 1826, a masterpiece is a chef dœuvre is a fine work of art. In Chambers in 1872, closer to the end of our period, a piece or work worthy of a master, a work of superior skill, chief excellence. Okay, so that's the context within the linguistic context within which these masterpiece rooms are being set up. Somewhat ironically for us, somewhat frustratingly for me when I was studying all of this, for some authors of the period, in fact for most authors of the period, the question of what we mean by a masterpiece didn't require an answer. It seemed to be a natural situation was that we have got a set of masterpieces. When preparing his guide to the Louvre, for example, Théophile Gautier, whom you see there, said, you don't have to, it's nice to be able to write book, um, pages about the Salon Carré, about the masterpiece room, this is in 1867, because you don't have to look for a transitory discourse which is explaining your um, meaning in the pages that you're writing on masterpieces, as they are to be seen in one room. Um, without distinguishing between country, between school, between period, um, we just can manage to jump from Van Eyck to Rubens. You don't need to explain why a painting is there. It's there because it is a masterpiece. It's a very circular argument, and it's presented me with a lot of problems in my study. What does become clear, however, from Gautier's comment, and this is one of the reasons I, I chose it, when we're talking about temporalities is, he said that there are no clear distinctions between countries, between schools, and between periods. So the illusion is quite clear here. In a museum such as the Louvre, which was at that time organising paintings into the kind of display which has be, become completely common for us nowadays, schools and periods, the masterpiece room was a, an oasis in the middle of this. It was a complete haven because all of a sudden you found yourself without this notion of school and period. But in fact, Gautier's comment does require some closer attention. Now, I don't want to give you too many figures, but let's have a quick look at this. In the Salon Carré, you've got 73 paintings, 43 by Italian artists, 18 by artists of various northern schools, Flemish, Dutch and German, 9 by French artists and 3 by Spanish artists. In the Tribuna in Florence, 40 paintings, 35 by Italian masters, 5 by northern school artists, Dürer, Rubens, Lucas van der Leyden and Van Dyck. And in Madrid, of the 50 paintings we can identify, 21 Italian, 17 Spanish, 11 Flemish, 4 German, 3 Dutch, 1 French. We've got a wide range of schools 
and a wide range of, of artists represented. So, from what Gautier said, without clear distinctions between countries, without clear distinctions between schools, this is correct. Without clear distinction between periods, temporality, here on the other hand, Gautier is entirely inaccurate. Because these rooms are being set up mainly mid 19th century. In the Tribuna, the most recent work is Guachino, Samian Sibyl, 1644. In Madrid, the most recent work is Murillo's uh, La Inmaculada de Escorial, uh, 1660 to 1665. And in Paris, the most recent work was Juvenet's Descent de Croix, 1697. So basically, in all three of these masterpiece rooms, no 18th, no 19th century works are accepted. Gautier's got it wrong when he's talking about periods. That's absolutely clear. In Paris, in effect, the situation is even more complicated, and that's why I'm going to be concentrating on Paris for that and for another reason, but mainly for this reason. It's because in the very first version of the masterpiece room, they put in this work, which is Watteau's um, Pellerinage. It only hung there for about a few months, and then it was removed, and nobody explained why. And we have to wait almost 40 years for an answer, because it's not until 1890 that one of the curators in the Louvre dares to explain why the work had been removed. Now, the quotation's in French, but I'm going to translate it. Um, Gruyère said, because one world ends at this time and another one begins. Painting becomes a question of anecdotes, of sentiment, and becomes sensual. A quest for beauty is no longer enough. Feminine eternal values, especially, undergo in art a transformation. For artists, women became refined beings with an unresolved soul worried and disturbed in their sensitivity. Our painters, during the 18th century, spoke another language. If you put them into the Salon Carré, you will immediately have discordant voices. They tried to put the most beautiful Watteau in the Louvre in there, and it just didn't work. Is it because it's not a masterpiece? No. It's just that Watteau has nothing in common with 17th century masters, even less with 16th and 15th century masters. There's a line that cannot be crossed. So there's this question of a temporality which is being established within the masterpiece rooms. Gruyère claims that there is a barrier, if we want, between the 17th and the 18th centuries, a crucial moment that so alters artistic production that it's impossible to juxtapose works from either side of this artistic paradigm-shifting rupture. Now, clearly this raises the whole problem of periods of epochs in artistic creation, but I mean, and also in artifact culture. Peter's already touched on the question of, of epochal culture. It's much wider than the approach which I want to adopt here, and I wouldn't have time to deal with it, and I think it would be the subject of, a, of another paper. But Gruyé also uses terms which I feel are insufficient to explain the problem, because he dismisses, if you remember, dismisses Watteau as a feminine artistic stylist, classing him with the sentimental and sensual. Now, the argument won't be decided here. I'm not going to um, try to venture onto the, the territory of specialists of early 18th century painting, um, but where Gruyère does seem to fall short of a wholly satisfactory argument, in my opinion, is precisely on this point. Vato was an important figure, a very important figure, although his critical fortune had known some ups and some downs in France, particularly during the 18th century, but he can scarcely be said to have exemplified artistic production in the whole of France throughout the whole of the 18th century. Vato does not represent the entire French 18th century school. Um, how, in that case, does Gruyère want to explain the exclusion of the French neoclassical school um, I hardly feel that paintings such as David's Sermon des Horaces, or indeed the Sabine, can be accused of being overly feminine and sensual. Um, they are rather, if we absolutely need a sound bite to match, Gruyère is probably resolutely male in terms of painting. Anyway, let's come back to the Gruyère text. He does say that the Vato is a masterpiece. So he accepts that it's a masterpiece, but he doesn't want it to be able to go into the masterpiece room. And it would seem that what Gruyère has seen, what he's groping towards but hasn't yet managed to theorise, 
is the question of the relation, I could even say correlation, by the way, between masterpieces and canon. And this is, I think, the crux of the matter is how far can we say that masterpieces identify with canon? Which thus means that we need to examine the importance of the canon when we're looking at 19th century museum culture and actually in contemporary museum culture. And I'm sure this is one of the, the things which is going to be um, discussed increasingly over the, over the next few days. Over recent decades, the argument about the canon, about its formation and its use, and even its right to exist has been fierce, particularly in literary studies, but also um, in art history studies and in other branches. One recent author in art historical studies claimed that the 19th century was not concerned with canon formation because, he says, 19th century authors, and I'm quoting him here, increasingly distanced themselves from normative judgments, focusing more and more on the objective registration and description of art historical facts. Now, I, for one, feel that it's rather difficult to equate that, equate that vision of a 19th century with the 19th century which we know was so keen on trying to create artistic representations of a pantheon of artists. And I'm just showing you one or two here. There's the Béranger and de la Roche reproduction of the Hemicycle from the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, um, Overbeck's um, Triumph of Religion in the Arts, and it has the Kaiser's Triumph of Antwerp Artists. Sorry, that's a very bad um, image. Now, what exactly do we mean by canon? It's a tricky term, certainly, and I cannot hope to do more today than sketch out very quickly one or two of the more important contributions in art history and also the contribution from other disciplines. But, start with Ernst Gombrich, who claimed that the existence of the canon was clear, who said, and I quote, in one of my recent publications, I have defended what I called the canon of excellence and its role in the fabric of civilization. Whether we think of the touchstones of greatness in literature, music, or art, the sharing of some frame of reference is a necessity for any culture. End of quotation. Now, Gombrich thus identifies a canon, states that it exists, that it plays an important role in the constitution of our collective memory and our shared civilization, observes that it is singular in number and that it needs to be used or at least referred to by the art historian in his work. He does not, however, suggest that it can be or should be studied, questioned or overthrown. And that's going to be one of the big questions that's going to start haunting art historians increasingly over the next few years. Um, now, one of the main models which has been used to prove the danger of the canon is the biblical canon, um, a finite list with a set number of books fixed at a certain time, since then unchanged, unchangeable. Nothing can be added, nothing can be taken away. Biblical canon which is set by divine inspiration and religious authority and a biblical canon where the status of the canonical book in the biblical tradition means that the biblical book, the canonical work, should not be touched. Its integrity can be worked upon only within the margins, in commentaries, in translations, and so on. And this is the model that has come down to us and that has been so helpful in art history in inspiring debate about what exactly we mean by the canon. Should we accept a canon should we accept an unmoving canon? Should our other canons in literature, in art, be allowed to expand? If they expand or if they change, does it deny their very existence as a canon? Can it be a canon if it is shifting? Um, one of the most important contributions, actually, has come from another biblical scholar, Philip Davis, who has pointed out an essential fact that we cannot confuse two distinct operations, canon formation and canon closure. And there's a massive difference between the two. As he says, the closure of a canon occurs with the production of an authoritative list. And until such time as we have this list, we cannot speak of a closed canon. So, with this model in mind, let's come back to the 19th century masterpiece rooms. The art canon didn't exist then, nor does it now, in an authoritative list. Authoritative list. It can't be fixed. Look at these various pantheons. Each time there's a different set of figures. Which doesn't mean to say they're in the canon, it's just that we're constantly looking for it, trying to fix it. And of course, the problem is further complicated in the museum, given the unique status of the artwork. Um, but what happened, 
as we saw, in these 19th century masterpiece rooms is that, first of all, the museums regularly changed the works of art on display, proving that there was already a desire to test the canon, to allow it to be open, to expand, and also to lose various parts. And it's worth, at this point, I think, remembering the elegant comment made by Francis Haskell in the first chapter of Rediscoveries, where he says that to survey the creation of the canon would be just as rewarding as to watch over its disintegration. There are the two movements which we need to bear in mind the whole time. And yet, there was one point on which, as we have seen, none of the museums was prepared to shift in terms of their use of the canon, and that was temporality. The end of the 17th century marked a cut-off date. In this respect, the Parisian Museum, I think, faced a particularly thorny problem in terms of its status within the contemporary art world. No one could claim that Madrid had ever been the most thriving centre of the arts within the European tradition. Good artists, yes, but the most thriving centre of the arts, no. Florence had been, but some centuries earlier. In 1850, the Louvre was situated in the most vibrant and thriving artistic centre of its time. The École des Beaux-Arts attracted students from all over the world, the Salon was one of the major events of the art calendar, Parisian artists were known far and wide, and the city was due to host the next great exhibition. Furthermore, just to add to our problems, the masterpiece room itself was, as I said, situated in the Salon Carré, which had become synonymous with the contemporary school of French art, which had now found itself ousted in order to offer a permanent home to the greatest works of the past. So, how do the French deal with this problem and burst open the canon? Well, they didn't, is the simple answer. They circumvented the problem and they created a parallel canon. Because at the same time as the Salon Carré opened in splendour in June 1851, with its cut-off date of uh, 1700, in another room, the Salle des Sept Cheminées, they opened the French Tribuna. So basically, two tribunas exist in the same museum. Thus, the problem was solved. And there, apparently, we could see um, this painting by David. Yeah, OK. This painting by Guérin. And um, basically, the question which came out of all of this was, why was it that, within this room, they created a new canon which remained limited um, to 18th century works, late 18th century, because the canon in this point was being proved to be something which was so closed that it couldn't allow any new entrance. Thank you very much. <laughs>